is the soundtrack of every Instagram video I recorded over the course of 2014 in chronological order. I toyed with the idea of explaining each one, but I think the mystery of it is pretty lively. It's about three minutes long, and um, headphone users, you might want to dial it down just a little bit. Hard to tell, for many reasons, none of them good, and all of them likely to cause me some measure of trouble once tax season comes around, exactly how many records I purchased over the last calendar year. Records like physical, vinyl records. By my count, using Discogs.com, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 33. According to Discogs, the minimum worth secondhand of all of those records is $387.47. Maximum is $843.54. The most monetarily valuable record I bought this year was David Berman's On the Other Ocean from Lovely Music Limited. You could argue, actually, that the copy of Eugene Chadbourne's Volume 2 solo acoustic guitar I purchased from Amoeba Music in LA is worth more since its minimum possible value is far higher than On the Other Ocean's minimum possible value, and my copy of solo acoustic guitar is signed, but I don't have a good story for Volume 2 solo acoustic guitar. It's just a good record, if you like 
weird guitar noises. On the Other Ocean was released in 1977. I got it from the Brooklyn Flea in Williamsburg, which I was at with my girlfriend, Molly. At the time, it was inside, and there's always this little corner filled with record vendors who bring cardboard boxes full of usually un- or very roughly organized records. For some reason, going through unorganized stacks is one of my least favorite ways of browsing records, which I know... Isn't that, like, supposed to be the main draw of record collecting? For me, it's not. I don't know why, but in this case, for whatever reason, I gave a look anyways, and I came across this record, which happens to be maybe the second or third piece of composed electronic music I'd ever heard. Like, I mean, I'd heard lots of electronic music, Chemical Brothers, Boards of Canada, Autechre of Ladislav Delay, but it wasn't until I got to college that I knew composers made electronic music. The first three electronic composers I ever heard were Karl-Heinz Stockhausen, David Berman, and Robert Ashley. I forget which Stockhausen it was. The Robert Ashley was automatic writing, which I still don't own, though I did manage to get my hands on a recording of the 1985 Rome performance of Atalanta Acts of God, which is the third most monetarily valuable record I bought in 2014 and perhaps my most personally valued record purchase of the year. Anyway. First, Stockhausen, second, Ashley, third, Berman's On the Other Ocean. It's a piece for electronics, flute, and bassoon. The electronics respond in real time in 1977 to what the instrumentalists are playing. The electronics are credited, actually, as Kim One, being responsible for harmonic responses. In the liner notes, Berman writes, Various enthusiasms contributed to the making of On the Other Ocean, for pure tunings and simple ratios, for homemade electronics with its mysterious knobs, its Lexan enclosures with the screw holes drilled not quite in the right places, and its hand-wired circuit boards inside, for idiosyncratic brews of electronic timbres that were not trying to imitate the sounds of the real world, and for a concept which was fresh at the time but now has become almost obnoxious through overuse. Interactivity. How true his final note on interactivity. When I got home after buying On the Other Ocean, having not heard it for several years, I was both excited and a little nervous. Knowing this piece, knowing interactivity was its heart and soul, I dreaded returning to this piece of much-beloved music and having its gimmick stare me gravely in the face. By the time I was out of college, interactive electronic music was a dirty phrase, an overused and abused way of inviting the audience into work such that, in the vast majority of it at least, No real decisions needed to be made. No real challenges to listener, to composer, to music were made. But no, on the other ocean, it stands up. To my ears, at least. Unhurried, Berman calls it. I'd call it maybe honest or thoughtful. Just as much now, 2014 going on 15, as I assume it was in 1977. In 2014, according to my personal Google calendar, so this is excluding work-related stuff, I will have had 432 scheduled events over the course of the year. The following is what happens if we sonify my calendar, meaning turn that data into sound. Each blip is one day. The higher the pitch of the blip, the more individual events I had on that day. I wrote the program so it skips my empty days. So where you hear a steady, uninterrupted tone, that's a number of days where I only had one thing scheduled each day. On the busiest day, I had seven things scheduled.
This year, I started wearing headphones in public for the first time in three years. I stopped a number of years back for a lot of reasons, all of which I'm now realizing I should probably say for another episode of Reasonably Sound, where I talk in depth about what it's like to wear headphones in public again for the first time in three years. But anyways, the first thing I noticed, so many more people are willing to make eye contact with you in public if you're wearing headphones. In 2014, I made two pieces of music. Well, I mean, I made lots of pieces of music, 95% of which were not meant to see the light of day, or, I guess, vibrate the air of rooms where there are other people. You, you get what I'm saying. A couple of them, you heard them at the beginning of this episode. They were in Instagram videos. This year, I wrote what I would call two significant pieces of music. Chronologically, the first was for a thing I made with a few friends, Ken, Emily, and Arletta. Emily is a virtual reality researcher and video blogger. Arletta is a dancer, and Ken is an artist and curator. Ken invited us to make a performance for the gallery he was working at at the time. All three of them are based in San Francisco, and I'm in New York, so we spent a couple months talking via email about what kinds of things we were interested in and what we'd be able to accomplish in the very few days we'd have to work in the space itself before the actual show. We all settled on this concept of conflicting spaces. What happens, we wondered, if we make a virtual reality video experience thing of the room the show is taking place in? That VR experience would be for one person to see at a time through Emily's own Oculus Rift, a sort of virtual reality headset thing. And they'd go from a crowded, darkish room in real life to that same room, but bright, nearly empty, in the Oculus. Arletta would be moving, dancing, interacting with the audience in both the real room and the Oculus room, but with much more elbow space in virtual reality, since it would just be her and the camera, or the person wearing the Oculus. So it would change the nature of her performance greatly. And then, what happens again when they go back, from Oculus, back to real life, from bright open to dark crowded? My goal, then, was to create two conflicting, but still related, sonic spaces. One that people could easily bear to stand around in for a while, having conversation while they were waiting to don the Oculus, and one much more personal and intense for when they and Arletta spend some quality VR time together. It was tough. I revised and revised and revised. I spent a couple days in the space putting everything into surround, so as you move around, navigating to get a drink, around Arletta, etc., the sound would change. I wrote a program to generate the audio for the Oculus part, and I maybe generated 10 or 15 versions, and of course, ended up going with the very first one. In the end, I got something I think complimented Emily and Arletta's amazing work well enough. Here's a rough audio-only simulation of what it sounded like to go from the room into the space of the Oculus, played on headphones, and then back to the room again.
The second larger piece of music I made in 2014 was for an evening-length dance piece choreographed by Hilary Easton and performed here in New York at St. Mark's Church. Hillary and I have worked together several times now, and the process is usually pretty straightforward. She and her company of dancers put together the movement section by section. I go to rehearsals and respond to what I'm seeing with musical ideas. We revise and revise and revise, and eventually, there's a score. Done. Showtime. This time, for this show, I entered really late in the process. The movement was mostly completed. The dancers about to go on a long couple-month break. Instead of rehearsals, I had a video which is something I'm used to. I've scored probably a dozen or so shows using just video, but there was something about this one. Maybe it was the angle. Maybe it was the day, the performance that happened to get captured. Maybe it was my mood. Who knows? But I spent a couple months writing music, checking in along the way to make sure it was right and we were on the same page and this and that, and I was and we felt good. But as soon as the dancers came back from the break, in the studio with warm bodies in real time, it was just off. Totally wrong. Had to be scrapped. Not all of it, half of it, but still, it was amazing to be seeing, literally, the same piece of movement, but thinking, oh no, 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 this is, this is totally wrong. This is totally different. So in a few weeks, the few weeks before the show opened, so no shortage of stress there, I rewrote half the show. Rewrote, re-recorded, totally new material because I had to. Here's a full minute from my favorite part, the movement portion of which sort of defies my verbal expertise. Jessica, one of the dancers in Hillary's company, has just come out on stage after a large contingent has left. Solo, she moves around the space, which is large. It's an actual church sanctuary. There's a wide, open wooden floor, huge vaulted ceiling with mezzanine all the way around and everything. She moves around this space with some measure of purpose. She looks to be... I don't know, like, tuning up? Checking that the limits of her body are still what she expects them to be. Her arms are still this long. Her legs still stride this far. And so on. If you want to give any of these things a further listen, including the music that got cut because it suddenly just wasn't right at all, I'll put links in the show notes at infiniteguest.org forward slash reasonably hyphen sound. And of course, in 2014, I started making reasonably sound. The original idea for the end of the year Infinite Guest Holiday Extravaganza edition of Reasonably Sound was that I might go back and revisit some of my favorite moments, but, well, two things. As we've discussed, I'm terrible at picking favorites, and I still feel like we're just getting started. Which, I mean, I think that's a good sign. That even when you are definitely past the getting started portion of making a thing, it feels like there is constantly ever more ground to cover. That in the making, you cannot but desire further and further making. Anyway, I feel like we're just getting started, and what am I going to do? I'm going to pick my favorite moment from three episodes ago that you probably remember pretty clearly because, I mean, we've only done this 11 times at this point. By the way, if I had to pick a favorite part from three episodes ago, it would be this bit about the growth of the cultural standard in Europe. In a weird way, then, the history and development of the pitch standard is also kind of the history and development of sonic standards, and in some perhaps overblown sense cultural standards. Insofar as a region's pitch standard and the sound of an ensemble that adheres to it is reflective of the values, traditions, or ideas of that region, 
which I honestly don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. The spread of A440 is also the spread of some cohesive idea of musical culture. So, but yeah, for the end of the year extravaganza, which the rest of the Infinite Guest crew is taking part in, so you should definitely check them all out, I decided to go beyond reasonably sound to my own year in sound, which really has been great for a dozen reasons. Not the least of which is the not insignificant group of people who have decided this podcast is worth listening to. So yeah, I know I did it on Thanksgiving, but I'm going to do it again. Thank you for listening. Thank you for writing nice things to me on Twitter and Instagram and Tumblr. Thanks especially for rating and writing nice things on iTunes. Thanks for sending me episode ideas, helping with research, and making the last bit of 2014 all the more interesting and fun and fulfilling, being more interested in a podcast about sound than I could have reasonably expected. My name is Mike Rugnetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at ReasonablySND, and me on pretty much everything at Mike Rugnetta. Reasonably Sound would be extravaganza-less without the Infinite Guest Network from American Public Media. This episode is part of the Infinite Guest year-end extravaganza. It is the perfect time to give a listen to the other shows on the network. For example, I am a huge fan of Emily Reese's Top Score, which is a podcast about video game scores and the composers that write them. Just the other day, someone on Twitter said of Top Score, quote, It is a dream come true. Video game music plus public radio equals beauty. I could not agree more. You can find that show and others as part of the year-end extravaganza at infiniteguest.org. Reasonably Sound will be back after all of the holiday shenanigans on January 8th, so please stay in touch in the meantime on the many internets, and until then, safe travels, tell your friends and or family that I said hi, hang out in front of the Yule Log, maybe drink some nog or something else that's not revolting. Happy holidays.